What we're talking about today is a extremely important property investment concept that is underrated, it is overlooked. You don't hear much talk of this because it's very difficult to do. This is one of the primary reasons that we've identified and I feel is responsible for Ripe House Advisory's extremely strong capital growth performance since 2015. Okay, it is street level analysis. This is not an advertisement. I'm gonna be jumping in in a deep dive today around this street level analysis. We need to understand this as property investors to be able to pick our spots. It is not just enough to identify a growth suburb. We have to identify the exact streets in that suburb set to lead that suburb forth. It's very common that even when a suburb is growing strongly in value, that there are street pockets in that suburb that are held down, okay? Remember, average growth is just that. There are above average streets and there are below average streets. It is our job as investors to target those above average streets. Before I dive in on this today, uh, please, if you like the content, if you like what we're talking about, it would be much appreciated if you can like this video and subscribe to the channel. Make sure to hit the bell icon so you are the first to be informed of any new videos directly uh, posted to the channel. If you do feel that this is useful information, it will be much appreciated from the bottom of my heart if you were to share this video with your friends and family. If you see a relevant post online in forums, chat, etc., whack it up there, post the link and create conversation around it. If you would like us to talk about street level analysis, areas that you might be interested in, happy to post screenshots and slides of individual suburbs in the comment section below. So please get involved, very important concept. What we are looking at here, I've recently just done a video on Townsville. So I haven't chosen this area for any particular reason other than that it is in Townsville. It is a good suburb to illustrate these points. Okay, it is Carajong in the Townsville market. This is not a buy recommendation or a sell recommendation. I'm just using it as an example. We can see here we've got different metrics that we use when performing street level comparisons or analysis. Occupancy type, okay, whether it's owner, occupier or rented. We've got property type, whether it's a house or a unit, we keep things simple, we don't go into subtypes, just the main ones. Sold price, this is sold price, an average sold price figure for the last 12 months. Rent price, yield, and the level of public housing in that street pocket, okay? You can see that the overall suburb is divided into a number of street pockets. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Each of those street pockets is around 200 dwellings. So it might be around 500 people. So there's around 4,000 people approximately that live in this suburb, all right? They live in very different ways and for very different reasons. It's our job to identify those pockets that are potentially going to grow in value strongest. And I'll talk you through the formulas and some of the data that we use to do that. First one. You often hear about the rule, I like to invest in streets with lots of owner occupiers, okay? If you don't have, the, the, the logic dictates that if you don't have any owner occupiers in the area, there's no one there to value add on their homes, to improve them. You want owner occupiers attracted to your street and that property that are going to be improving other properties like it. That increases their value, which then brings yours up alongside it. Owner occupiers generally have more scarcity, longer tenure times, lower stock turnover, so you have a tightness in a market which generally leads to good, strong uh, capital growth. But we also want tenants. We also want tenants to be attracted to the area because we want someone to rent our investment property. So sometimes too many owner occupiers can become a bit of an issue. We do need a tenant mix. Our general rule is to target streets with about two thirds or more in owner occupiers, okay? Not too many not too few. Uh, when we start getting up to sort of 90% range of owner occupiers, we don't really have enough tenants there in a mix. So this pocket here, 43%, too fewer owner occupiers for my liking. This one here, 43, too few. This one here at 67, 69, 80. These are our sweet spots. These ones are on the border, so it could be a maybe, but all of a sudden we've gone from eight down to three sweet spots, uh, street areas, that would potentially match our requirements. Let's move on to the next property type. 
this is a theory around we want to be focusing our attention on the most common and in-demand property types. If we buy a unit in a suburb because that's all of our budget can afford, but everyone wants to live in houses and that's where the vacancies rates are tight, that's where the growth is occurring, we might have a white elephant. We might have got the suburb right, but the property type wrong. We have to get this consistent. In this particular area, we can see very clearly that houses are the most popular types of uh, properties. In this pocket here where we had lots of renters, they are also renting units, okay? Because we've got about 49% of units in this street pocket. So we can see this band is predominantly houses and this is where the owner occupiers are attracted. So this is where we need to focus our attention and by far houses are the most popular type of dwelling in this suburb. So we've now still, our three areas and these potential maybes are all still in flux as we've moved through the, the different metrics. Sold prices, okay? This is not necessarily to target areas to, to address. You know, we might be targeting a cheaper pocket in a suburb because that has more room to grow compared to other areas. But this is now used to prime ourselves to look and investigate yield because that's very important to performance. Once again, we can see these owner-occupier pockets with houses as generally more expensive. This is house price sales, very importantly. This is not an all or a unit house price sales. So even though these pockets are predominantly or half and half houses and units, we are only tracking house sales. So very importantly, we've identified a cheap pocket here, 260,000 versus almost 300 or over 350,000 in this pocket here. We've got a vast discrepancy, a vast change in price in the one suburb, okay? This pocket may have been compressed and depressed while this pocket has run away in terms of price. Um, this is often very, you know, uh, uh, you know, very rare that people conduct this type of analysis and it is absolutely critical. I'll explain why. What if we looked at a property here that was available for purchase for 300,000, okay? We think that it's cheap because the suburb median overall might be 320. We think we've got a good deal, but we've actually almost paid 15% more than the average price in this street area. We think we've got a bargain, but we've actually just probably paid the suburb, the, the street record for properties in that street pocket. We have to understand price terrain to determine whether we are achieving a good price for that area or a bad price. So let's move forward with rents. Once again, these pockets, outstanding, very strong above average rents. This is one of our keys when doing street level analysis. This pocket here in the middle, it's ticking all of our boxes so far, but this one. So this has crossed off my list. This one here and this one here are our two primaries. These are our two secondaries. Now bringing those two numbers together, okay, we are looking at yield. Yield is a very strong driver of imminent and short-term price growth, okay? We like to target the streets in a suburb that have above average yield. Very difficult to calculate. I'm not aware of any other sources, okay? We can see here, this pocket that we were umming and ahhing about, very low yield, it's ruled out. This pocket here, okay, which has a lower price point, excellent yield, the best in the suburb, very good. These ones, not so much. Remember our two primaries, 6.1 and 5.8? These are looking very positive still. They're on the upper end of the spectrum for yield in the area. Why is this one, do you think, and post a comment if you like, why is this one in the suburb at 6.3% the highest yielding area? Remember the sole prices have been depressed in this area. Rents are not bad, okay? Yields are very strong. Why aren't we considering this area for our, our purchase? Let's go to public housing. Because it has 21.1% of public housing in the street, okay? That's why prices are depressed, okay? That's why street appeal is lower in this area. That's why it's still generally renting okay because there's a floor in rents across the country because, you know, and I'll be very perfectly blunt, don't take this the wrong way, but generally people, uh, you know, they have a, 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 a lower band and it might be government benefits that are covering rents. So generally we see a floor in rents of around $300 a week, right? When properties are cheaper, the yield is higher. 
okay, for those, that is not necessarily a flaw under property values, but there is a flaw generally on what rents people can achieve. So generally we see a negative correlation between price and rents. That means as prices go down, rents stay the same. So yields, sorry, a positive, a, I'll say that again. Generally, we see a reverse correlation between price and yield. As prices go down, rents have a floor, so yields generally go up, okay? That's what we see here, right? Lots of renters, renting units with lots of public housing, but they're still paying a reasonable amount. Obviously, the, 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 the private renters are still paying a reasonable amount because there is a floor in rents. Property prices are lower in this pocket, uh, so then you've, therefore yields are higher. This is a no-go zone, all right? We've seen and done a lot of research on street level dynamics in the past. We have to stay away from this area like the plague. These two pockets here, 0% public housing. Can you remember this process of elimination? These are our two primaries. These are now our two secondaries. This one's got a little bit of public housing, but not really too much to be concerned. We have to focus our attention on these two pockets in this suburb. It's only 25% of the suburb. All of a sudden, we have gone from 4,000 people, or 4,000 people, uh, residents, to around 1,000. That's our area of focus. 400 dwellings, it's not, uh, it's only 400 dwellings worthy of our attention. If we're not doing this type of analysis, how much can we potentially be impacted? How much can we overpay? How can our growth be impacted? Okay, so this is research that we have done almost 10 years ago, all right, eight years ago. We did this deep dive analysis. We construct our own weightages. How does public housing impact value and growth? You can see here when there is, you know, 100% is average prices, okay? 100% is average, is, you know, a unit of property prices. When public housing is 0% in the street, we can expect over 20% above than the average growth, all right? So imminent and predicted growth is over 20% the average at 100, okay? It's very similar for inner regional and for major cities in, this, in the country. As we go here to over 18% public housing in a street area, we would expect to be just under 20% less capital growth. So if the suburb grows at 10%, 0% public housing, you'd expect over 12% 12 12 public uh, price growth. If the suburb grows at 10% and is more than 18% public housing in the street, you'd expect just over 8% capital growth. Public housing has a major impact on property price performance. Let me skip to the next slide here. What other factors have a very strong impact on property price performance? Proximity to schools, shopping and transport. Okay, we've done a lot of analysis over the years on this. Too close is sometimes uh, not a good thing, right? Think about it with schools. Right on the doorstep at zero meters has a 6% decrease in, in your expectation for value. 250 out to 500 meters away from the school is your optimum zone. And then when you're out over 1500 meters from a school, there's strong negative impact. We want to be in nice and tight, not too close, but close enough for us to walk. We don't want the school bell ringing next door or the congestion around cars. 250 to 500 meters from a school is the optimum. Proximity to shopping, anything out to about 1500 meters is the optimum and the nearest shop right on the doorstep is okay. And then we have another sweet spot, potentially driving distance around that thousand to 1500 square meters. It's very rare, rare that we get this perfect for each property, okay? But we have this and we need to have this in the back of our mind when analyzing a property. We need to understand how values are changing based on its proximity to these key elements. We've done this research for doctor's surgeries, hospitals, parks, uh, restaurants, you know, many different variables. And these are by far and away the three big ones. Okay, other ones that are very obviously important are beach and proximity to water, but other sort of man-made amenities, these are the big three. Well and truly, you know, doctor surgeries, hospitals, restaurants, not really a correlation. These are the big three, very important to know this. I've gone the wrong way. The Ripe House sweet spot, we call it. 
Okay, we have to get this street level information right. It is extremely important. I have a name for it. It is the Ripe House sweet spot. Okay, it is extremely important. We can see here that when we get this right, we can expect 21.9% above average relative price performance. That means if the suburb grows 10% in the year, we would expect 12.19% capital growth in that same suburb if you get the streets right. If you get those, those two street areas right, as in Carajong, we'd expect this type of above average performance. What does this mean? Well, this is going back now a while when Sydney prices were uh, 800,000, but this is a hypothetical market. Over a 10 year period, this extra price performance results in $240,000 in extra capital growth. It's extremely important to get this right. What do you think guys? Does it make sense? Any questions? We would love you to leave a comment. Have you seen this type of analysis before? Have you thought about it? Let's create a conversation. Hopefully this has been informative. Thank you.